Good evening, I'm Mike Goucher. This is Sunday Night. It is my decision that police officers John A. Balzerzak, Joseph T. Gabrich, and Richard W. Perubkin be dismissed from the Milwaukee Police Department. These are the faces and facts behind the names of the two fired police officers. John Balzerzak is 34 years old. He joined the police department in 1985 and received 19 merit arrests along with a Superior Achievement Award. Joseph Gabrish is 28. He was sworn in as a police officer in 1984. He also had 19 merit arrests along with a Superior Achievement Award. One police administrator described them as good young cops, but their lives would be changed forever the morning of May 27. That's when Gabrish, Balzerzak, and Richard Perupkin encountered Jeffrey Dahmer and 14-year-old Conrad Synthesen Pohm. They say they followed proper police procedures during their investigation, which eventually resulted in Synthesen Pohm being returned to Dahmer's apartment. He was later killed. But in an exclusive interview Sunday night, Police Chief Ariola strongly criticized the officers' actions of May 27. What did they do? What did they do? Now, there are any number of things that they could have done, but they didn't do anything. Ariola was also critical of Balzerzak's handling of this phone call from resident Glenda Cleveland. What if he's a child, a nominal adult? I mean, are you positive this is an yep. adult? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I explained to you, it's all taken care of. It's as positive as I can be. Uh, God, I wish that call had been received by a supervisor at that district. Perhaps we would have seen a different result. Ariola's comments have angered the police association and some city residents. Meanwhile, attorneys for the officers today filed their appeals with the Fire and Police Commission. Next on this special primetime Sunday night, the officer's side of the Synthes and Pone story. And good evening again and welcome to a primetime edition of Sunday Night. I'm Mike Goucher and our guest tonight, our police officer... John Balzerzak, police officer Joe Gabrish, an attorney for the Milwaukee Police Association representing these officers, Lori Eggert, and the president of the Milwaukee Police Association, Brad Nebraska. Thanks to all of you for being with us tonight. Let me begin by going back to the early morning hours of May 27. We heard in that piece that at least one top police administrator referred to you guys as good cops. Do you believe you were good cops on May 27? I believe I was as good a cop as I've ever been on that night and throughout my career. I always strive to be the best uh, type of police officer that uh, the city of Milwaukee has ever had. Joe, let me ask you the same question. Were you a good cop that night? Yes. We handled the call the way we felt it should be handled and the way that we've handled several, several calls much like it over the years. Um, the police chief, though, said they didn't do anything. He doesn't believe you did enough. Well, what do you say to that? When you heard the police chief say that, what was your response? Joe, let's begin with you. My reaction to that was I was very surprised because of his internal investigation and the face-to-face -face that we had with him. We informed him um, everything that we knew, uh, everything that we did, and we believe that we had come to a reasonable uh, into that call that we had handled that call sufficiently and uh, you know in hindsight as we find out months later that uh, this tragedy happened I'd just like to add that uh, at the end of a shift we turn in a report on every call that we are at and, and a code callback goes to the dispatcher afterwards and that our actions taken on that night were acceptable for over two months no one ever questioned the type of action that we that we did or how we handled that call until in hindsight this came up and, and that is at that point that they looked back two months and began to suspect what we did or had at that point indifference to what we had done the chief said and again you heard him he said why didn't they ask for the names of witnesses either one of you can respond to that did you and if you didn't why not um, our arrival at an assignment, it's our duty to address the problem that we were sent to uh, on our arrival initially, and that's what uh, we did. We were sent to uh, a naked man down, and on our arrival we 
found what we were sent to. And we addressed that problem first and proceed from there. Were there witnesses even there at the time? We didn't actually get a chance to talk to any witnesses. In reality, what happened is we drove up, we focused our attention to the assignment we were sent to, as John said, the naked man down in the alley. Witnesses, as we came up, approached us. They were asked, and they were asked very kindly uh, to stand on the site and wait until we had the opportunity to discuss what the goings on and get a chance to interview them. There came a point where we had to deal with the fire department and, and talk to the fire department. These individuals again approached. They were told again, please stand back, allow us to do our investigation. We will get with you as soon as we can. At that point, we, uh, the, the crowd of people as well as these presumed witnesses became basically hostile and profane towards us. And at that point, an officer had to give them a warning to stay back out of the way. Um, they stepped back finally at that point. We continued our investigation uh, to the fullest and to the end of, of the investigation, or there came a point when we felt the investigation was concluded, uh, except for the fact that we hadn't talked to witnesses. And we returned to the squad in the alley. And at that point, the crowd of people that had been there, it dispersed and there was no one to speak to. You also got to remember that the call came in anonymously. No one took a name of a caller, so there was no place to go to follow up. We further felt uh, that there was no crime, that no crime had been committed at that point, and that we did not seek any witnesses door to door because we felt that there hadn't actually been a crime or a need to obtain witnesses at that point. So again, based on your experience, to this day, you still feel, given the circumstances that were presented to you at that point in time, that your actions were entirely appropriate, given what you saw there in the early morning hours of May 22nd? At the, at the time, with the information that we had, we, I, to this day, I feel we did the appropriate and the, the, the best that we could with the information and what we had available. I want to address a couple of other points, uh, ones that you gentlemen have obviously heard discussed in this community a lot. One of them is, uh, is a radio transmission. It involves uh, uh, the officers basically telling that they were done at, at that point in time. Um, I'm wondering if we can, if we can roll that tape and, and let the audience listen. And then I want to get your perspective on, on, on what was said, why it was said, how you feel about what was said. Let's see if we can listen to that tape. The intoxicated Asian naked male <laughs> to his sober boyfriend, and uh, we're at 8. That for be a minute, my partner's going to get de-loused at the station. There is a time frame in between, though, so we don't want to make it seem like those were back-to-back -back statements. We want to make that clear, but some people are going to say that's insensitive, that that's an example of, of an insensitivity that uh, is unacceptable. I want to get your perspective. Why were the comments made, and... Uh, and what do they represent, if anything? Either one of you can answer. Uh, if you can, r which comment, what are you referring to? In the, 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 the laughter, first, the yeah, first, and then the delousing remark. The, as far as my uh, explanation as to how we handled the assignment, the way it used to be with the department, uh, now they want a short, terse type of response, uh, and that is not always appropriate for the uh, how we handle a situation, and I find sometimes uh, elaboration is needed, and that's what I did as far as the uh, my response to the 10-8. Mm -hmm. As a response to the uh, the delousing, to, that was, was a comical, jocular type of way of myself expressing that uh, my party needed to, to clean up. It is a type of transmission that is commonplace on the department. Anybody that has a police scanner or, or any news media who has a police scanner or responds to calls would, uh, would know this and it is a, is a common occurrence, that type of jocularity. No reference to any specific incident that you handle, but just a matter of, uh, of a little bit of, a re of relief, comical type of... So something that's said on the job 
uh, not, not a sign of insensitivity, is what Correct. you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, one other point about that, and, and that is the, the Glenda Cleveland phone conversation. <clears throat> and, and this is a woman who called, she was a concerned citizen, and she called because she thought she recognized Conrad Synthesis and Pone, the 14-year-old Laotian boy. Um, I want to ask about the way that call was handled. The chief felt that it, it was not handled properly. We heard him say, I wish a police supervisor had been there to handle the call. Um, again, I want to listen to the tape, and then I want to ask you why it was handled the way it was handled. Uh, let's roll the tape, please. What if he's a child, a nominal adult? I mean, are you positive this is an adult? Ma'am, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Like I explained to you, it, it's all taken care of. It's as positive as I, I can be. Oh, I see. Okay, there's so a, no, I, I can't that, do anything about somebody's sexual preferences in life. Well, I mean, no, it, I'm not it, saying anything know. about that, but it appeared to have been a child. This is my no, concern. It, no, 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 he's he's not. He's not a child. No, he's not. Okay, oh. and it's a a boyfriend boyfriend thing. And why the response was uh, was there nothing that seemed abnormal about that, or, or how how did you handle it, and why? Well, you have to understand that. Uh, I personally was on the scene along with mm -hmm. uh, four other officers and uh, additional personnel. We had first-hand knowledge of what it was there, and we viewed the parties that we had gotten sent to. And the conversation uh, with Miss Cleveland begins with that she's calling for someone, uh, that she wasn't actually there, did not actually view what was transpiring, was not directly involved in what was transpiring. And I felt that my first-hand knowledge was uh, more informative than uh, what she had heard from someone else. And the woman was not directly involved in what transpired, and I am not, uh, as anyone should be, not uh, in a position to release information regarding assignments over the telephone to someone uh, that's calling regarding him. When you, when you think back on the events of that morning, uh, both of you can answer this. Um, would it have been possible to do anything differently? How often do you think about what was done and, and gee, could I have done it differently? Well, obviously, obviously something like this goes through your mind, especially with the investigations and the media gone through my mind thousands of times look back on it and as I've said in, in previous interviews that I wish there had been some other piece of evidence or information available to us if we would have seen something something that stood out in the apartment or something if we could have taken another direction um, was handled the way it would have been routinely handled if a supervisor would have been there with us I'm sure in my mind that the supervisor would have made the same decision that we made with the information available and under the same circumstances. The police chief called Jeffrey Dahmer a, a smooth con man. I don't know if you're legally able to answer that question. Your impressions of Jeffrey Dahmer at that scene that, that morning? My conversations with uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, he was a straightforward, calm, uh, convincing person who voluntarily uh, came forward with information, voluntarily cooperated, uh, not the hint of any stress uh, regarding what was uh, uh, being investigated, not the, the hint of any, uh, that he did not want us to continue in our investigation in any manner, but voluntarily uh, volu volunteered information and cooperation with us to the extreme. Laurie, you've, uh, you've represented uh, the police officers. Uh, based on what you know at this point in time about the case, um, is there any room for second guessing in your mind, the officers' actions that, that morning? Well, there's always room for second guessing, and, and no human being could go through what these officers went through without rethinking it and wondering if there was something they could have done to save this boy's life. And we now know that he was a boy. Back then, they believed he was an adult. But there are always choices to be made, and what you vest in a police officer is the authority to make decisions, spot decisions, and he has to live with the decisions that he makes. 
there could always be other choices and there are always different ways to investigate and the question is not could they have done something different but did they do the appropriate things at the time and i think it's important that the community look at what these officers knew when they arrived at the scene not what we now know about Dahmer, not what we now know from the witnesses. These officers did not know that at the time, and they investigated from what they had in front of them. How difficult has it been the last six or seven weeks for the two of you uh, since the, uh, the initial suspensions and, uh, and, and now the firings? Uh, describe what life has been like for the two of you. John, why don't you go ahead? For me, uh, at the time of the, uh, the suspension, I was not even in Milwaukee. I was uh, uh, aiding and uh, visiting my in-law who is uh, uh, very ill with cancer. Uh, and I was in out of state at the time and it was a very difficult time for me to be isolated and have no conversation with anyone from the department or with any, any way to respond to the things that were being uh, said about myself my partner and the other officers that were there. It was intensely stressful. Uh, it was a very emotional time for myself and my family at the time. And still is, I would imagine. Yes, it is. Uh, Joe, same question. Well, whether you're aware of it or not, Michael, you're the one who told me I was suspended. I'll start answering the question on television, that way. On the That's how I cast. found out uh, that I was suspended. Uh, it, it was upsetting and, and it was scary to sit in my living room and find out mm -hmm. that way that I was suspended, especially after I had gone uh, forward to the commander and the detective bureau earlier in the week uh, with information that we had been there two months earlier and that I had cooperated with them and they told me not to worry that, you know, we did everything that we possibly could have done at the time. And those are quotes from commanders in, in that bureau. So they, they seem to support what you were saying at the time. We, we did everything followed proper police procedure, we did what we could do then, and, and other of your commanders said, we agree, you did do that? Yes, I spoke to several of my commanders and uh, other supervisors throughout the department, and they made the same con conclusion based on the facts that were on hand the night in question. To, to further answer your question, what, what has it been like? It's been very difficult to read the paper. Um, in fact, I've stopped reading the paper. But to see pictures of yourself as you walk down the street on the front of a sentinel box or things like that, and to be in a position not to really be allowed to speak out because of pending investigations and pending hearings to tell your side of the story, it's been a very difficult time. What do you want people in this community to know about, about you? What, what should they know about Joe Gabers and what should they know about John Balzer, Zach? You said that it's been difficult for you. You feel like in, in many cases you've been vilified. Um, what would you say? What, what kind of person are you? What do you want them to know? Well, I think that we've both been made out to be some sort of uncaring, uh, twosome, some sort of monster, which is simply not true. And I'll speak for myself that I'm a very caring individual and I I pride myself on that, very sensitive to the needs of my friends and to this community at large, otherwise I would not have chosen to work here. And I think that's important that people realize that we chose to work down in the inner city because we wanted to help people out where we thought it was needed the most, a very busy area of town, they need the police down there, and that we care about the community. John, same question. Uh, what would you like people to know about police officer John Balser? I'd like them to realize that uh, what I, I was portrayed as, what my partner was portrayed as, just is not true. Uh, we are very caring and we do love the job that we uh, chose for our careers and that the area of the city that we chose to serve. As Joel stated, uh, you could write for a transfer or request a different squad or something along those lines, but we chose not to. We, we felt that our, our services were needed there. And as I've displayed in the past of uh, uh, my career, and I've displayed, as Joe has, the, the willingness to work and work hard for the city, especially in a busy area of the city. And uh, I would just like to, the thousands of people 
uh, throughout our careers that, that we have had come in contact with and, and have helped and have gone the, the extra mile to, to uh, help out uh, to solve their problems uh, to the best of our abilities. One final question on that, and then I want to take a break. Um, question of remorse. Do you feel remorse for, for the families? Uh, and I ask that because I, I hear both of you saying that, you know, we did what was right, at least in our minds, what we thought was right that time. Um, do you still feel remorse? Is remorse a feeling that you experience these days? I think you have to separate the, the issue here. The issue that we thought we did everything right mm -hmm. it should be it's taken separate separately from, from the <clears throat> fact of how we feel. Obviously, this is something that's going to be with us forever, the fact that this individual died and that other individuals died after we had contact. It's hard to deal with. It's always there. And I feel personally saddened for the families of all these people that, uh, that they have to go through this tragedy. Yeah. I've uh, expressed my sorrow to, again, uh, it was a stressful, emotional situation uh, uh, where I was at the time. Uh, of the news, and I expressed my sorrow and emotion through throughout this uh, to the families, and, and as Joel stated, to to, to know that uh, someone who we had contact with, I've had I've had many a situation. Uh, I've had my sergeant killed uh, in a directly in, involved in an incident uh, that I was at, and uh, that it is this is more so emotional and stressful on myself because uh, y you begin to, to to look back and as Joe says you, you'll, you'll never forget uh, that how close things were at the, at, uh, uh, coming in contact with you with, with an individual that died later. Mm -hmm. I want to take a break. Uh, we will continue and I want to talk about some of the other issues that uh, it should be explored given the events of the last seven weeks. We'll continue on the special primetime edition of Sunday Night in just a moment. Come to the Isuzu Invitational and you might discover that you're a real trooper. Because you'll like the four-wheel drive with auto-locking hubs, tough four-wheel disc brakes, and knowing you got the best buy in town. Best of all, you'll love saving up to $2,300 more. So hurry, the Isuzu Invitational is the perfect time to be a trooper and to compare and save. Or really just save, because with Isuzu, there's no comparison. Save on Trooper at your local Milwaukee Isuzu dealer. Warner Cable brings the great performances home this fall with exclusive new movies made just for cable on USA. Gregory Hines in the mystery thriller, White Lie. Nancy McKeon is haunted in The Lightning Field. USA's big new movies every week. Installation is free. Plus, when you order HBO, you'll receive one free month of Cinemax. Warner Cable. Great performances every day. I work on a cruise ship 50 feet below the surface. Love boat, it ain't. That's why I bank with First Wisconsin. Like you, I figure making money is hard enough. Banking shouldn't be. First Wisconsin gives me the most convenient services like direct deposit and banking by phone. And best of all, I always see a friendly face. First Wisconsin. Making money is hard enough. Banking shouldn't be. The pictures you've just been looking at were from last Saturday. They were of a, a vigil held at uh, MacArthur Square that was in support of police officers in this community. And I want to begin this segment by talking with Milwaukee Police Association President Brad DeBrasca. Brad, we've heard a lot about uh, a diminishing of support for police officers in this community. Do you think that's true? Or, or do you think that, that perhaps uh, this case can be separated from overall support for police? Well, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I think it's very apparent, uh, based on the number of calls we are receiving and the, and the amount of support we are receiving, 
at the particular events that there is widespread support uh, for the police officers and specifically these two officers and the other officer that was involved on May 27th. Uh, and I think a lot of it revolves around the decision by the chief. Uh, hindsight is 2020. And I want to follow up on the, some of the comments the officers made, one in particular, and that's the discretion. Back on September 26th of last year, uh, Chief Ariola indicated that he wants to give officers and supervisors additional discretion over and above a significant amount that is inherent in the job of police uh, or law enforcement on the streets. Well, what has happened since then is he has taken a discretionary call, and you have to remember, an officer who is on a scene of a call Hypothetically, if there's a hundred pieces of data available to that individual officer, the best investigator going back to that scene may only recognize 50% of those pieces of data. But yet the chief has chosen to discharge these officers based on a hindsight 2020 perspective on a discretionary call. And it runs inconsistent with the philosophy of law enforcement as it relates to community oriented policing or problem solving conflict resolution. Do you think, uh, Lori Eggert, that you will eventually have to go to court to resolve this in a way that would satisfy these two men and, and you? Or do you believe there will be a fair hearing before the Fire and Police Commission? Well, we have to believe that there will be a fair hearing before the Commission, but we also have to wonder how we can get that fair hearing when the mayor has already come out and said that he supports the decision of the chief of police. And that is a very unusual circumstance for the mayor to publicly announce that he has decided that the chief's decision was correct. And now the body that we go to on our appeal are five appointees, four of whom I believe are appointees of this mayor. Do you expect you'll get a fair appeal? I mean, do you have any hopes that, that during the appeal process that, that uh, the Fire and Police Commission would say, we disagree with the chief's decision to discipline you? Do you think that's a possibility, honestly? I would hope that the, uh, they would view the entire facts of the case, uh, both, both internal and uh, the other parts of the investigation. I would hope that they would uh, see that we did act properly. Uh, that's what I hope, and uh, I can only one step at a time right now. Mm -hmm. Joe, do you think there's a realistic possibility the, the Fire and Police Commission is going to say we disagree with the police chief? Well, again, I, I hope that they do. Um, I don't know that that'll happen or not, but rather than to sit here and say that it's not going to happen, I challenge them to look at the facts and do the right thing after they look at the facts. I believe the right thing is to reinstate us. You both still want to be Milwaukee cops, do you not? I would want to be a Milwaukee police officer. I'd like to be a police officer. That's it, what I've chosen for my career. Whether I would be able to be an effective officer after what I've gone through through this entire ordeal, uh, that's a question that would have to be answered if I was given that opportunity. I, I can't at this time tell you. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I hear you saying you do want to be a Milwaukee cop. I think I'd, I'd like to go back being a police officer, I grew up in Milwaukee. This is the town I chose. This is where I applied, and I've been on this job for nine years. My first interest right now is really to clear my name, to get this firing out of my record, because it's going to make it very difficult to go anywhere else. When you start reviewing your background, I'm sure I have 19 merit arrests and superior achievements awards and things like that. But at the same time, they're going to see that the end of that says, that, you know, I was fired for you know, making a decision, and I'd like to clear that up. Talk about the uh, the chasm that exists between the police chief of the city of Milwaukee and uh, and not just the police union leadership, uh, Brad, but uh, but police officers. Uh, we are told it is a large. Uh, division. We see uh, the, the uh, poll that you conducted that says 93 percent of the officers who returned their ballots uh, did not have confidence in the chief. Um, is the gap actually that wide? I think it's wider 
than even that, and more so today than when we ran the poll, and there's a reason why. Not only do they not have any conf confidence in the chief, they no longer hold trust in the chief, and the reason being is because of his unprecedented attitude in his publicity and statements regarding the internal investigation that we had an understanding for as long as this police department has been here that that information is not revealed even the face-to-face -face meetings where he said he wants to learn from the officers on an individual basis about the circumstances revolving around this he immediately thereafter went public when we had an understanding that that information would not be recorded nor would it be used in any trial or anything subsequent to that face-to-face. -face. That is the understanding we had with the chief. He has violated that. The, the officers can no longer sit in front of the chief and expect him to hold that information confidential. So it has skewed the whole system. Uh, so now we have, in terms of support for the chief, not beyond con the lack of confidence, the lack of trust and sincerity in the office. And that is going to create problems down the road. He said uh, the other night, though, he said, you know, my job is not to win a popularity contest. My job is to serve the community. Uh, if the officers don't like him, is, is that, I mean, should they like him? I mean, we all know bosses we don't like. I, mean, I think it's pretty typical for, for most employees not to like their bosses. How important is that? Let me answer it this way. The chief of police stated unequivocally when we were on two labor retreats that his constituency rests in this rank, the mayor, the common council, the fire and police commission, and the community, and the police officers last. So one has to wonder what the mission of the office of the chief of police now is. Is it to serve the community or is it to serve the political needs of the mayor? He has stated publicly his constituency in that order. In fact, I have a document to that effect. We are hired to serve the community, the officers, and that is our mission. But when we have the chief of police whose constituency is the mayor, it becomes very difficult with this political concept to carry out our goals. I, I want to continue on, uh, on, on that path, but I want to take a break right now. We'll continue with this uh, special edition of Sunday Night in just a moment. To be number one and stay number one requires size, flexibility, strength, and customer satisfaction. Ford's phones and fitness, they're back at North Point Ford, Wisconsin's largest. Now nearly 800 new and used 91 and 90 cars and trucks include a $548 deluxe one-year membership to Vic Tanny and a portable car phone worth $459. Plus 200 new 91 escorts include 2.9% 48-month no-limit financing. North Point Ford! On North 76. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you Keep smiling until Across town, across the country Wherever your trail leads You know Sitco quality will always keep you well on your way Till we Where can you get fresh center cut bone in pork chops for $1.58 a pound? With your Sentry ad coupon. Where can you get Dole Premium Golden Bananas for just 28 cents a pound? With your Sentry ad coupon. Where can you get Sentry Brand Premium Frozen Pizza for only $1.98 each? With your Sentry ad coupon. And where can you get Borden's Ice Cream Assorted mm -hmm. Flavors one half gallon for $1.38? With your Sentry ad coupon. For great low prices, shop Sentry Foods. Uh, Mr. DeBrasca, uh, who in some respects as a union official, and I've said this to him, I said, you know, why don't you try to be like Walter Ruther instead of Jimmy Hoffa and somehow work with me and work with the department towards mutual goals.
The words of Police Chief Philip Ariola on Sunday night. We'll let you respond to that. Has he said that to you? Why can't you be more like Walter Ruther rather than Jimmy Hoffa? And what has your response been to that? First, this police union has worked with the Milwaukee Police Department up until the point that he came on board. As it relates to name calling, I want to apologize to the community for the office of the chief of police. The police chief has to give this community an apology for name calling. As far as I'm concerned, it's unbecoming and it's unpro unprofessional for a police chief to call not only myself, but any individual in this community names. It's inappropriate. He would say, though, it's inappropriate, Brad, for uh, the International uh, Association president to come to town and tell him he ought to resign because he's not competent to do the job. I, I guess the question I'm asking, is it personal between the chief and you? Well, apparently he's taking it personal. I'm not. I'm not. And let me tell you why. Ever since this chief came to town, there are certain things that he has not done. And obviously the community is the top priority, even though he puts it on the bottom of his list. That's the top priority he should be working uh, towards. Reduction of crime, safety in the community. He, that's on the bottom of his list. But he suggested that this union was confrontational ever since he came. And I'm not so sure it was initially, but shortly thereafter. And let me explain why the confrontation started. We had an officer who died in the line of duty chasing somebody, had a heart attack. The chief failed to show up at the hospital to comfort the family, to show care that the city of Milwaukee and the police department would do everything they could to take care of the family. He just didn't come. We brought it to his attention. We said, chief, this is a traditional practice. It's very important that the chief of police, when an officer dies in the line of duty, to come to the hospital. Well. That started it, and it went downhill from there. Now the Dahmer case arises, and of course, he immediately took on this attempt to influence every rank in the police department by calling an internal meeting inside the police administration building, played a portion of the tape we heard early on, on your show, and selected information out of the criminal investigation, and his, some of his closing comments and we're getting a better feel of the chief in general. Who is this chief? We're to suggest, and I, it's real close to a quote, nobody in this city is going to tarnish my image. He does take it very personal. We're not talking about justice or help in the community. We're talking about the chief's ego and his image and his resume. And that's prob very problematic for law enforcement when we see this. Let me move over to, to, to two men who were officers. Um, um, I don't know whether you can comment on this. Maybe you don't want to comment on it because of the, the status of your case. But uh, can you describe morale on the force right now? What was it like? I'll leave that to your discretion. I <coughs> watched the attorney briefs <laughs> a sigh there. Uh, answer it any way you feel comfortable. I, prior to the incident, uh, mor morale has constantly uh, uh, been downhill for uh, a wide range of reasons. Uh, at, I'm speaking from a, a personal knowledge at, at uh, Third District on the late ship. Uh, bodies are taken from us and not replaced. Uh, and your, the workload is still there and ever increasing. And there's no resolution from your boss, the chief of police, uh, to solve that problem, to, to, to aid you in what you're doing for your community. Uh, what do you think of the, what the chief has done? I mean, he, he, uh, he's made it very clear that he, he wants his officers to relate well to the community, that he wants his officers to uh, go the extra mile, which, which he said in a, in a videotape that was played for all the officers back uh, a couple of weeks before the Conrex and the Symphony incident. Uh, is he this universally hated figure, or, or do people uh, feel less strongly about him than that? I think that there's a lot of disappointment in him. Uh, he's not even in this city two years, and 94% of his men did not stand behind him. 
And, and for those reasons, that there's, there's shortages in manpower, he specializes and he takes men away from certain things and doesn't replace them. I think he's got to go back to some basics and uh, look at the, the problems of the increase of the calls and the increase of crime and homicides and pay a little more attention to those items before he starts specializing here and there and taking manpower away from where it's truly needed. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, your encounter with the chief, uh, not the word encounter, but your face-to-face -face meeting with the chief. You've been quoted, Joe, I heard you on the radio the other day saying that uh, you really felt he had his mind made up pretty much. Uh, is that the case for both of you when you had your face-to-face -face meeting with him? Did you think the decision had already been made, this was a formality? I felt very strongly that his, his mind had already made up been made up before that. Uh, in fact, uh, the way the whole thing came off that afternoon, uh, we arrived there at 2 o'clock. That was the time we were supposed to be there, and we were left standing in the hallway till shortly before 3, and we were never given a reason or apologized to for being treated in such a fashion. And he fully knew that the media was out at the place where we met, at the academy. Uh, once inside, um, every time I attempted to answer questions, uh, it was cut short or interrupted by him. Um, and even at one point, uh, he made the, the thing that, uh, or the statement rather, that because I had an impeccable record, that this was what made it so hard on him, as if he was inferring that he had already made up his mind. I, I truly believe he did before we went in there. In fact, the other day uh, when he came out, I believe he said that he had all the information he needed already as of the 25th or 26th of July. So I, I truly believe his mind was made up long ago. He said uh, you had an impeccable record. Did he convey disappointment to you? Did, did he say because of your records, which uh, as we stated earlier, uh, certainly had been good solid police records. Uh, did he say that flat out, that, that he was disappointed in you? To me, he stated during my face-to-face uh, uh, -face with him uh, that uh, my record uh, speaks highly of me, and uh, uh, he stated that, uh, uh, not that it made him hard on him, but uh, uh, that it was a difficult decision for him. Um, my face-to-face, -face, I, I went into uh, it with an open mind, hoping that uh, uh, the chief would, but uh, I soon found that... Uh, his uh, mind was closed to w what he said he was, he was there for, and that was to, to listen to, to the officers. Well, one more question about that, and I'll ask Lori Eggert this question. Lori, there were rumors around town, and, and if you would comment on them, please, that, that there was a possibility, at least, of uh, these two individuals uh, being given the same punishment as Richard Perubkin, and, and th that, that, I don't want to call it a deal, but that agreement would basically be that there would be some sort of, for lack of a better term, apology or statement of remorse on their part or a statement that perhaps we didn't use the best of judgment and then they might also be held in abeyance as uh, Officer Perubkin has been. Was that ever kicked around and uh, um, uh, would that have been acceptable? No one ever approached us with any kind of a deal. I don't know if there was a deal worked out with Officer Perubkin or if that was just the chief's determination that that was the appropriate discipline. Um, I don't know that that would have been considered by us in any serious manner. I, I don't think it's particularly useful to do the what-ifs on this. But these officers, I believe, would have had great difficulty in saying they did something wrong that night when they honestly believed that they handled the call properly. I don't believe they have any problem expressing remorse or sadness for how the call turned out. And like everyone else, Everyone in the world wishes they hadn't believed Jeffrey Dahmer, and I'm sure that's true for these officers, too. It's time to take another break. We'll be back with Sunday night in just a moment. Every business morning, while the rest of the world is getting up... UPS is guaranteeing overnight delivery before 10.30. For far less than other companies charge. And every business morning, more people are waking up to that fact. Good morning. Good morning. A furnace? Not a day of trouble, ever. Must be a good one. Must be a Lennox. It must be. <laughs>
Now get cash back or 0% financing. If you're looking for quality and a company that's reliable, I would suggest La Charity Moore Jones for a scene. For quality proven over 110 years of family business, call my friend Dave Drakem. We strive to keep your family comfortable. That a boy, Dave. Who else treats you right with a taste fantastic like the Peanut Buster Parfait for just $1.39? Dairy Queen with crunchy peanuts and layers of thick hot fudge. Who else treats you right with a $1.39 banana split? Absolutely delicious. The Dairy Queen Peanut Buster Parfait and Banana Split. Only at your Dairy Queen store. Now only $1.39 each. We treat you right. Dairy Queen. Let us tell the citizens that the nature of this job is stressful and their efforts are often rewarded by being spat upon. That was uh, something said by Alderwoman Annette Sherbert at a rally that was held at City Hall shortly after this uh, all began. Uh, is that true? Do people, and we've asked this, I guess, in other ways tonight, but do people not appreciate police officers, or is that an overstatement? I don't get, in my conversations with people in the public, I still feel like people are pretty supportive of police. I have a tendency to, to agree with you. I think the point uh, Alderman Sherbert was trying to make was that all too often uh, the media doesn't give the exposure to the life of a police officer, you know, along with the rates in violent crime uh, across the board in the violent crime categories comes an extreme amount of danger for police officers and that is escalating likewise but along with that comes additional arrests time away from the family additional time in court missed holidays and a whole array of stress inducing factors that we don't put any emphasis on and unless we recognize those things we are not going to get the proper support from the community that uh, should come from the community because uh, this police department is still one of the best even without support for the chief uh, we will continue to do a professional job in a professional manner i want to get an opinion from from the three others around here in addition to brad uh, one of the things we've heard talked about in this is that this is an issue that somehow seems to have split the community along racial lines and uh, i know as an attorney maybe you're not the best person to ask about this but you work with these officers and other police officers. Um, are there deep racial divisions in, in the way police are perceived in this community? I think everyone has their own perceptions of whether police are racist or police are fair. And I don't think there's much that people can do to change your innate perceptions. But I do firmly believe, my perception is, that police officers are there to deal with crime and to protect citizens and to investigate calls. I don't think that they make the distinctions of black and white when they investigate a call. And particularly in this situation where there was some uh, feeling or belief by part of the community that these officers just blew off the witnesses because they were black. I think that's ridiculous where these officers deal day in and day out with black citizens. If they blew off black citizens all day long, there would be nothing for them to do at work. And these officers have demonstrated throughout their careers that they do take comments by all citizens seriously. They investigate everything, and they have not made those distinctions in their lives. Uh, you've heard it, I'm sure, uh, Joe and John. Uh, I mean, I've heard it too. People say, uh, let's change the circumstances of the Dahmer case. Jeffrey Dahmer is a black man, and Conrad Synthes Apone is a white young man. Would that may have made any difference? In my mind, it wouldn't have made any difference whatsoever. Be had the facts that there was a caring relationship between two individuals and uh, we believe that that uh, relationship had existed and it wasn't based on any race, uh, creed, color. We never make decisions based on that. We deal with the facts at hand. Uh, we investigate to our fullest and come up with a solution to the problem and that's why we're sent there to come up with some sort of solution to take care of a, a problem at hand. I'll let you reply to that, Judge. I would say the same thing, and I would also like to add that the, our, our records, work records, and 
what we've done throughout our career for that part of the city should be should speak for itself. Uh, I, I feel that uh, uh, everything that, that both Joe and I have done throughout our careers is uh, totally based on, on the facts. Uh, you don't take into consideration uh, that uh, uh, the victim or suspect is white or black or Hispanic or whatever race there may be. And, or, like Joe says, it's just not it's just not done. If, if it were done, I would be the first to, to come forward and not want to want that type of officer for my partner, as I'm sure Joel would too. How tough is it to be a cop these days, in your mind? Seems like it's getting tougher every day, it, and for whatever reason, the crime is increasing so rapidly in this city. And you can see just by the homicide rate alone, it's, it's doubled since I began in 1984. And that's just a small part of what's going on. There's increases in all sorts of crime. And with those increases in crime, there comes the increase in the calls for service for police officers. And there just doesn't seem to be enough officers on the street to handle the amount of calls that are coming in right now. And that's resulting in great backlogs for police service and calls for police. And it's further resulting in people having to wait several hours for an officer to arrive sometimes. Uh, I'd just like to add on that is the, that uh, uh, we bear the brunt of what's being done with this department because we are the most accessible to a person when we respond to a call. Uh, many a time it's brought to our attention that a call came into the department five hours earlier uh, and sad to say five hours earlier I was, I was not, on, not working at the time. I was uh, at home and it's a, it's a, a tough situation uh, uh, that you have to explain to the uh, uh, people that, that call and, and need the police that we have no control over that as uh, the officer on the street. We respond as quickly as we ever did, if not faster. Uh, it's just that the we don't get the calls uh, because of manpower constraints and so forth. I want to ask one more question about, uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask it, and again, answer it uh, uh, as you see fit. And, uh, uh, and Laurie, if you're bothered by the question, you can jump in, but let, let me say this. That there are going to be some people who say that the one question I have about that, those early morning hours is if, if they had run a check on Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, all of this might have been different. Uh, first of all, is that... Is that typical that people run checks? And would there have been any guarantee that Jeffrey Dahmer's record would have been something that would show up and be available to you? Well, we don't, we don't routinely check out complainants or people who have come forward to help us out. And that's what Jeffrey Dahmer did. He had come forward. He, he wanted to help us. He uh, very cooperative. Uh, it's not routinely, routinely done that you, you do, would scrutinize a complainant or somebody that's willing to help you. They're insulted by things like that and they're remiss. They, they don't want to get involved for future things for, for fear that that's going to happen. And for that reason, uh, it's, uh, it's not routinely done at all cases unless you're suspect of something and we weren't at the time. I think John can continue with that thought. Uh, the, just the intimidation that would be felt by, by someone who uh, is coming forward to uh, uh, to help an officer on the street would be an, an immense. Uh, uh, this Mr. Dahmer was, as Joe said uh, and I said earlier, is was uh, as calm and as cooperative as could be. There was uh, uh, took us voluntarily uh, went back to his apartment. We uh, uh, voluntarily, no hesitation about entering his apartment. There was, was absolutely. Uh, uh, nothing that would uh, lead you to believe that this was not as uh, a, a call, uh, the numerous, uh, countless other calls that uh, uh, we've handled throughout our careers. And his story during the entire time you were there seemed consistent to you. What, yes. what he said that this is so-and-so, John Mung, or whatever his name was at that point in time. What, what he uh, gave us as uh, uh, the, what was uh, happening there were substantiated uh, uh, by what we observed, uh, the totality of the, the whole situation. We continued to investigate, went 
back to uh, substantiate uh, his uh, statements uh, uh, at his apartment, and everything was corroborated, uh, and there was nothing that was out of place. Time for one final break. We'll continue on Sunday night. Be back with the final segment in just a moment.